This is a short film about a wall. More importantly, it's about the people who live on either side of that wall. It's also a film about a girl who lived on both sides. A girl whose life dispels many stereotypes around our own identity and how we are perceived by the other. In many ways, her story has enriched much of what I know about the past and more importantly, the futility of the hurt and trauma that's been caused between both communities. Almost 100 years since the partition of Ireland and 50 years since the breakout of the conflict in 1969, I explore how far we have come as a society and ask, will we ever see our walls coming down? My granny Margaret was born on the Shankill Road in 1908. 13 years before the Northern State was created with the partitioning of Ireland, leading to almost a century of conflict. Her own father, my distant grandfather, was a member of the British Army and the Orange Order. For a boy like me growing up in the 80s, the Shankill was only a street away, but may as well have been another world away. The tightly knit streets, not unlike my own, could only be viewed through the barbed wire and steel protected fences of our neighbours' upstairs houses that straddled the peace line. The people were alien to me, and the separation wall that lined the bottom of my street, it was said, was a necessary protection from the mobs that will once again attempt to burn our houses to the ground, along with a towering Catholic church that shadows Clonard streets. My only contact was through nightly rats when yous would have spent many hours exchanging bricks, bottles and anything we could get our hands on to return the favour. Those on the other side were always a faceless construct built through images of loyalist marches, stories of 69 and the threat of random sectarian killings. I came from a prominent Irish Republican family, where all male members went to jail or were killed by the British state. My granddad Patsy ran the local Clattered Martyrs Band, where much of my youth was spent hand in hand alongside the rest of the family, and trips to Bodenstown always hold special memories. The burning of Clattered in 1969, leading to the outbreak of the conflict, shaped much of what the area is today with many young men and women who defended their homes later becoming members of the IRA, with countless losing their lives over the coming years. So to learn that my own great-grandfather was a member of the Orange Order and British Army, inspired many questions around identity and the trajectory of my own cultural heritage. Fifty years after the events of 1969, what does identity mean to a younger generation? What does the wall mean? And will we ever see the demolition of the most physical barrier to peace? Many of these questions have been asked by youth workers from Clonard Youth Club, an organisation that brings people together from the Falls and Shankill Roads. It's an inspiring project that would have been inconceivable during my younger days. And to see the kids so comfortable together does suggest major strides have been made since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. However, Having grown up in an interface area all my life, it becomes second nature to welcome any progress with a certain level of caution. I spoke to a number of youths who live in the shadow of the wall to ask their thoughts and fears of what life might be like without it. And you were saying to me something that something I didn't know. There's been a bit of rat in here this last... I, mean, I haven't heard that in yes, a, 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 a while. The last five nights now, there's been two shots communities now. I think the first two times it just happened, but the other two times it's been organised. And they've obviously come out and how we were at, and you can see ours who came up on from offering. So, we'll obviously, a few packed the through at these houses here. So, uh, it's been happening. It's tricky enough. Like. So, Ross, you were, you were from that far from here, weren't you? Yeah. Just see them houses there, just in behind them. Basically, we used to come down every day at that wee football pitch there and stuff, and only a one minute walk, if even, from my house. So. And what do you remember? I mean, this fall, the wall's obviously been as. As far back as you can remember, this wall's been here? Oh, it's been here my whole lifetime, like. And what does it represent to you? Just a divide to stop trouble. Just prevent any ratting or basically going back to the troubles. It's just there to divide that. Have you ever been on the other side of the wall? I've been a couple of times. I've been to the Clannard Youth Club and stuff, which is on the other side, just up a wee bit. And I've walked up and down the Springfield Road and stuff. 
What is the first memory that you've had of meeting someone across the wall? When I was eight, I done a cross community thing in New Life City Church. Tell me a bit about that. It was just like doing activities and stuff, like football and just other things like that. And I believe you met somebody when you were at Yeah. Tell me about that. My boyfriend. And where's he from? Ballysalm. Which is? The other side. Yeah. The other side. And you met him when you were eight at a cross community event? Yeah. That's some story there? I know. And what do you think about the possibilities of all coming down? I don't think there is a possibility. Because people still have like the conflict in their heads. Hearing Leah's experience brings me back to my own grandmother's story, which gave me the opportunity to ask my father about our own history. She came from the heart of the Shankle, and uh, she worked in the mills along the falls there, and she met uh, my grandfather, who lived in Norfolk Street. I think he had a shop in Norfolk Street at the time, and obviously they fell in love. Uh, but because she was a Protestant, um, she converted to uh, Catholicism. And I think she had to stay in the, with the nuns at the corner of Dunmore Street there for, a, for want of a better term, a decontamination period of a number of months before they, they had the right to marry and bring up the, the family and the Catholic tradition, etc. Um, her, her, her father was demobbed from the British Army and joined the A Specials, which was a full-time reserve, police reserve then. And uh, he had served with them for, for a while. On the other side of the family, my father said um, they were born out of Turin Street on the Grabner Road in the 1920s. Uh, my great grandfather was seriously injured. He w worked in the shipyard, and at the time, Catholic workers were expelled from the shipyard uh, by extreme loyalists. And because of his injuries, he died prematurely. So you can contrast the two positions and of the family background, you know. The events in Bombay Street in August 1969 led to the killing of a local boy, Gerald McCauley. With many families forced to flee their burning homes, 50 years on, there are plans to commemorate an important and pivotal moment in the conflict. However, as Irish Republicans looked at these events as a warning to history, I wanted to know how it was for the Unionist community on the other side of the wall. What was the spark that led to what many believe was the point of no return, leading to many years of war? I always tell describe it that people call it the night that Belfast burned, because all you could see into the sky was the flickering of flames. Well, if, you go, if I try and recall the first night, I can remember people coming into our street and say they're coming. They're, they're coming to get us, they're coming to burn us out. You know, and, and I'll use that loosely, I'm not going to use the F word, if you understand. Uh, and that's, that's what was said, right? And that sets the tone for what happens later on. And, 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 there are those of us that believe that it was a necessity. I was fearful about all my family that, that lived in the room. My, my old grandmother, uh, who lived closer to the falls than any of the rest of the family. Uh, my mum, my dad, my, my brothers and my sisters. Uh, the atmosphere, as I say, was something that I would never like to get back to again. But you have to, it's hard to get into the mindset if you're from today to exactly why people resorted to that sort of thing back think, there. It's you what, think people it's what, were manipulated by higher powers? I think on both sides Aye. people were manipulated. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that uh, it doesn't forgive it. I wouldn't like to go back there. Uh, this, this saddens me to see this. So it does that we in Belfast 50 years later are still divided. A wall keeps us apart. Yeah. Um, I don't think it comes down to my lifetime. It's not just about removing barriers. Like I lived in this area well before any physical barriers were erected. There were mental, uh, psychological barriers. You know, we knew not to go outside the area. Uh, at certain times of year, we call it the mad month in July, when people who normally talk with you, played football with you from the far side of that interface, suddenly stopped talking to you. You know, and, and you knew that growing up, you didn't know the politics behind it. But you knew there was something drastically wrong. But you also had a sense of alienation from the state. It wasn't your state. It wasn't your police force, etc. It wasn't your flag. Now, you couldn't really politicize at that time in terms of what was happening, but you knew that problem existed and that form of alienation was there, even when you're growing up as a kid before the conflict erupted again. 
As I look towards a new generation, I find myself asking the same questions. Are the conditions still prevalent for the conflict to reignite once again? How long will it be before we remove the scourge of sectarianism, and by extension, the wall that separates our children? Unfortunately, I believe it will be a very long time before we do. However, I've learnt a lot in the short time I've spent with these youths. I'm also deeply encouraged by the often thankless work that goes on at grassroots levels between the communities of the Shankle and the Falls. For it's here that real change is making the difference. From the burning ashes of Clarence Street is where I trace my own. Not 50 yards across the wall. My blood runs blue as well. The red brick walls and darkened halls where secrets never met. For fear a neighbour lent us here. To something he'd regret. To the sharp and steel and concrete wall that separates our mind. Where the language of indifference knows never to be kind. The towering church that rang its bells and panicked cry for help. To boys and girls and fearless herds through the smell of burning fault. Near 50 years of blood and tears some said would never learn. To put the past behind us and embrace another world. But Belfast streets refuse to give its secrets of the past with the unrelenting notion that the eyes already cast. My truth is mine and yours is yours. No need for compromise. When a monopoly of victims can hide a thousand lies. When pain and years of suffering is just reserved for some. The ones we leave behind us will not escape the gun. <laughs>